Welcome to the season finale of the Block Party, and I don't think we could ask for a better guest. Stanley Cup winning general manager, Julian Breezewell, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here, Seth. Uh, thank you so much. Listen, I, I want to know right off the bat, you've seen all of the players celebrate. They had the boat parade, the parade at Ray J. What player has impressed you the most so far with their partying and celebration? Well, that's a good, it's a good question. I, I asked them to celebrate this uh, according to how great an accomplishment it was and how hard it was for us to win. And I'm glad to see they've listened to me and uh, taken full of advantage of, uh, of the celebrations and spending it together and sharing it with their loved ones. So that was awesome. But to answer your question, it's a little bit like the, the Cons Mike trophy. It, it could have gone to many people. Uh, a lot of, a lot of players had just incredible playoff uh, runs, whether it's Victor Hedman, who was a well-deserving uh, Conn Smythe Trophy winner, but uh, Braden Point, Nikita Kucherov, Andre Vasilevsky, all of their performances, if you compare them to the performances of past Conn Smythe Trophy winners, they, they compare pretty favorably. Uh, and I think with regards to who's been the MVP of our party, it's the same thing. We could have multiple winners, but I think – if I have, I can't even name one. If I can name, if I can limit it to two, I'm going to go with uh, Cooch and Pat Maroon. They've been, uh, they've been epic. I would agree with that, by the way. I would, those are the, I, those are the top two with me. So listen, I, I want to know kind of, let's just take me through, you know, the, the season a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the deadline deals. Uh, a lot of people were saying that you gave up too much at the deadline. I wasn't one of those people at all. I saw what you did with the Coleman deal, especially because, you know, he's locked in for next year. You know, tell me, uh, how did those deals come to be? Were you targeting those players for a while? You know, come the deadline, we, we felt we could really benefit from adding two strong, physical, defensively re reliable forwards. Like we were looking at our group and we felt if we could add those two pieces with a little bit of size, but certainly some, some, some snarl, um, it would not just add depth to our team, but it would improve our team. It would elevate our team and would increase our odds of, of winning the Stanley cup. So that's what we were looking for all the while considering the cap ramifications and the fact that even before this pandemic, we were going to face a cap crunch this off season. We're going to have to make some decisions and probably let some players go. So if we could acquire players, um, especially at the deadline, because the prices are so high, if we could acquire players that were also under contracts that were pretty favorable to us going forward, that would make sense. And the two players that kind of checked those boxes were uh, Barclay Goodrow and Blake Coleman. So those are the two guys really that I, I honed in on and pursued uh, from probably late January on. And luckily for us, we were able to acquire both. And sometimes it's sometimes the stars align for you. And this was one of those years and, and it worked out uh, great for everyone. So it's, it's nice when it works out. No, just, I'm fascinated by the, you know, by what you do, the trades and all that, how, how all that stuff comes to be. How does a trade for, for Blake Coleman or Goodrow, how does that, how does that start? And then, you know, how do those talks go over the course of a month or so before you finally pull the trigger? Is it a lot of negotiating or, or what? Well, first of all, trades are like, they're all different, right? The circumstances for every trade is different. But if I, if I look at those two, they were pretty similar uh, in the sense that uh, we had identified what we felt like were needs uh, or certainly things that would, again, elevate our team, improve our team, not just add that, but improve our team. If we're going to spend up, spend some future assets, significant future assets, we needed to be a better team, not just a more deep team. And so we'd identified those two players. Part of it was they were on teams that at that point uh, kind of knew they were probably not going to make the playoffs and would be, you know, so-called sellers at the deadline. So I called both general managers. I, neither player was available. I don't, and I believe both of them that they weren't considering moving either until I called. Uh, I was probably the first one uh, because they were under contract going forward and they were under uh, favorable terms. So, um, I just aggressively pursued them. I kept calling and uh, at, at some point, um, the Blake Coleman one kind of came to fruition sooner. I, I just stepped up and I, I said, I know you don't want to trade him, but what if I give you this? And that caught their attention. Uh, Tom Fitzgerald, the general manager of the New Jersey Devils. And that was the whole point of the offer was to 
make him think, reconsider his position. And I suspect uh, that at that point, he started shopping Blake around and eventually there was a, a, a mini bidding war for his services. And we came up with the best offer and we got to, to, to you know, close the deal with New Jersey and it worked out great for us. Wow. Uh, with Barclay Goodrow, it was somewhat similar. Um, but the dynamic was a little different where I said, I, I, it was just a little bit different and it took longer uh, because it was a little bit of a different situation, but eventually we were able to agree to terms and come up with an offer that forced San Jose and their general manager, Doug Wilson, to think that it was in the best interest of his organization to close the deal. And it worked out, uh, it worked out great for us. I don't want to play the what if game, but let's play the what if game. I mean, I, do you, do you feel like you win the cup without Goodrow and Coleman? I the reality is we needed everyone that was in there, everyone that contributed, the players, the support staff, the coaches, the management, the scouts over the years to build up this critical mass of good players. We needed everyone's contribution in order to win the Stanley Cup. And on top of that, we needed some luck along the way. It is so hard to win the cup. I mentioned earlier, we had four guys that essentially played at a consummate level for four rounds. And we needed all four of them to play at that level to squeeze out a, a Stanley Cup championship. So uh, we'll never know. Uh, the reality to answer your question, we'll never know if we would have won without the trades. But I feel a lot more confident that our odds were better uh, of us winning the, 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 the Cup after making those trades. I felt good about our team after making those trades. Now, how much time have you had with the cup? Because I feel like right now, kalorn has been the only guy that's been spending time with the cup. Have you had a, a moment with it at all to talk to it? Tell, tell me about it, Julian. You know, I, I haven't had time to track or hear of, uh, like I haven't tracked any of the media. I haven't had a chance yet. Uh, in a few weeks, maybe things will quiet down and I can circle back and, and appreciate the coverage a little bit. So if Alex Killorn has been the one with the cup the most, Good for Alex Killer. He's a key member of our team and was a key contributor to this championship. I hope he's sharing it with his teammates because they deserve it just as much. Uh, I've had a little bit of time with the Cup in order to take some good pictures, both on Monday night in uh, Edmonton, and then especially when we landed uh, Tuesday night and we got to uh, to see our families again, uh, my wife, my two boys, and, and take some pictures with them and share share the trophy with, with, with them because that's what the Stanley Cup is meant for. It is meant to be shared. Yesterday, we really appreciated the opportunity to share it with our fans. We were overwhelmed by the turnout, to be honest. It was beyond our expectations, all of us within the organization. Um, and we're so happy to share with them and thank them for their support. But eventually, you know, it's just awesome to share it. And, and we're working right now to make sure that our players are able to share it with their loved ones and, uh, and fully appreciate the accomplishment. Julian, listen, I know that you're, you're a team guy, so, you know, you might not answer this question, but, you know, is there a move that you made since last off season that you're just, you're really proud of? Was it a, the Shattenkirk? Was it Maroon? Was it the trades? Was it Bogosian? Was there anything you did where you go, man, I am just, I, I'm proud that I pulled that off or, or that was a key to us winning the cup this year? Well, the reality is, again, we don't get to try both scenarios and see how it plays out. I'm just happy that it played out the way it did. And the stars aligned for us, and we won the cup. Our guys dig so deep within themselves, physically and mentally, in order for us to win this championship. Uh, I, I don't know that we appreciate it more or less because of the bubble experience, because I've never won the cup before, so I can't compare. But I strongly believe that the sacrifices required for our team to win the Stanley Cup, that was the highest price anyone's had to pay to win a Stanley Cup ever. And I don't think any other team, unless we end up in a situation like this again, will have to make as many sacrifices. The time away from the families, the pause, the, all the testing, the, the isolation in these bubbles, uh, on top of the normal sacrifices that need to be that are required in order for a team to win a championship, no one's paid a higher price in terms of sacrifices by its players and its staff than the 2020 Tampa Bay Lightning to win the Stanley Cup. So which one, like, they all have to happen for us to win the cup, I think. So there's not one that stands out. 
Uh, how are you tired? Are you good that you don't have to get any more COVID tests for a while? Uh, yeah, that, uh, well, the reality is we'll be reopening our facilities actually quite, like quite shortly. And in the next phase, we were like the health and safety of our players and our staff, it, it's, it's of paramount importance to us. And we'll be testing again, uh, on a very regular basis every other day or so, as soon as we open our facility in a few weeks. So. Uh, for now, we're not testing. Actually, we're pretty privileged that we were able to get that, you know, get those tests throughout and make sure that everyone was healthy and everyone was safe uh, because we wouldn't have been able to, 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 to come back and resume the season and, and compete for the Stanley Cup uh, if we didn't have access to those tests. So. Who do you think gave the Bolts their toughest matchup in the bubble? You know, they were all four teams were really good, uh, and I've I've mentioned some of their general managers since, since we've won when they reached out that like iron sharpens iron, right? So every team kind of got us ready for the next challenge. Um, they were all good. I saw Columbus from from early on their from their exhibition games, their series against Toronto. I knew like if we ended up playing them, they would be a really tough out. Boston were the Presidents Trophy winners. Their experience, they were Stanley Cup finalists last year. They're a tough out. The Islanders, as things were going, they were building up to this crescendo uh, of, of just high-end play, uh, and they were tough. And then you get to the Stanley Cup finals, and you're facing another team that was one of the top teams during the regular season who just eliminated three teams themselves. They're feeling pretty good about themselves. Uh, they were a tough out. So I don't know. I think they were – they were all really tough. And the reality is it's really hard to win a single playoff game, let alone four playoff games against the same team. And then to do that four times, it's incredibly hard. I think people underestimate how hard that is, how demanding that is. And I'm so proud of our players and our coaches and our support staff for, for everything that they've accomplished this summer. Not that it matters at all. Just, I'm just, just from a fan's perspective, I thought the Islanders were, were – they, they worried me the most. That series started to worry me a little bit. So uh, I thought that they gave the Bulls the, the toughest competition. They, they were certainly tough. But, we, again, we start the playoffs with an eight-period game against the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. Like that, that was the toughest game. Like that takes so much out of you. It took so much out of our players that I'm not even sure they've fully recovered yet. And they still found a way to win 15 other games after that game. Like, I am in awe of what they've accomplished. I am in awe of their resilience, and their physical resilience, their mental resilience. But that game in particular, like, I was awestruck as I was watching, not even knowing if we were going to win or not. I couldn't believe the level of play uh, that they were at with, while they were still, like, they were eight periods in. And they were still playing at such a high level. It was, it was truly impressive. Julian, tell me what you saw in Coach Cooper when you hired him in 2010. Obviously, you know, a lot of people wanted Coach Cooper gone after what happened last season. Everybody, you hung tight, you stuck with him. It paid off. I saw him at Raymond James Stadium last night, and nobody had more swagger than Coach Cooper with the cigar, with the kids, carrying the trophies. I mean, the, the guy clearly is relishing it and soaking it in like he should. When, when you first hired him, what did you see in Coach Cooper? Well, first and foremost, it's a leadership position. Being a head coach, we were looking for a head coach for our minor league team at the time. And you're looking for a strong leader. So the first quality that kind of struck me was I, I thought there was some strong leadership there. There's some charisma. Uh, there's some swagger, as you mentioned. Uh, there's some smarts. Uh, so the leadership was one. And at the time, if I'm being more particular, I was looking for someone that had uh, the ability to – there was a really good communicator. Uh, that had kind of a propensity to be a teacher and that was able to build relationships with his players that went beyond the typical player-coach relationship. Um, so those were the things that I was looking for, and he checked all those boxes, and 10 years later, he's a Stanley Cup champion. And of all the people, and I'm so happy for myself, selfishly, but I'm happy for our owner, who is the best owner in sports and who's put so much so many resources and so and he's been so supportive over the years and and for everything he does for our community not just our organization he deserves it more than anyone so i'm happy for jeff vinnick i'm happy for our, our players our sports staff our fans but I, in particular i'm happy for jeff uh, for john cooper because head coaches always get a disproportionate amount of blame when a team's eliminated and 
it's nice that this year he doesn't have to deal with it. Was it just a bad series last year with Columbus? I think so. That was my take all along. Uh, just like we needed pixie dust along the way to get us to winning the Stanley Cup this year, last year the pixie dust just wasn't there. So that's one. Two, Columbus was a, a really good team even a year ago. Uh, they had progressed over the course of the season, had really improved their power play with some acquisitions at the trade deadline. They hired Marty St. Louis to come in as a consultant and work on their power play, and their power play really took off. And their players are, are better and more skilled than people give him credit for. So they were a tough out. They played great, and they deserve to win. They played better than us. At the time, and I remember mentioning this, the issue wasn't so much that we lost to Columbus. There's no shame in that. Even getting, even getting swept, that happens. Like Kudos to them. They found a way to win four games. The issue I had was that we, we didn't make it hard enough on them to beat us. We, we weren't even close to playing to our potential, and that was for a number of reasons, but it was also a very small sample. It was four games probably over the course of, what, seven days? Uh, that's yeah. a small sample if you compare it to everything that had happened, everything that that team had accomplished over the course of the four or five previous seasons. They're going to game seven uh, of the conference finals against Washington and, and losing to the eventual cup champions. Going to the conference finals against Pittsburgh, losing in game seven to the eventual Stanley Cup champions. Going to the Stanley Cup Finals, losing in six to Chicago, who obviously won the, the Stanley Cup that year. Even nineteen, even during the 18-19 season, we had we won 62 games over those 82. We had 128 points. Our players just kept finding ways to win games. That to me was more indicative of our team than those four games in April of 2019. Good, good answer. I really appreciate you explaining that. Now, I got to ask you, my favorite player, Steven Stamkos, you've been asked about it enough. I know you've been giving, you know, finally some answers today. But I, I want to know, when Stamkos boarded that plane in Toronto, were the expectations that he was going to start playing in the round robin games? Yeah, we expected him to, to get into at least one. And uh, we actually had a conversation with uh, Steven, uh, Coop and I, I think the day before we boarded the plane to kind of go over how he was feeling and what his expectations were. And uh, we were hopeful, they, you never know, we were hopeful he might even play in all three of the seeding games. Uh, but ideally at least two, at least one. And then things just didn't progress uh, as we had all expected. Uh, it was obviously – very frustrating for, for Stammer and uh, understanding because he's so like you, he works all year to get ready for the playoffs. He, the whole point, what, what he's chasing, what we're chasing is the cup. And, and now he has to rehab instead of being on the ice where he wants to be and where he knows he can help us. So that's frustrating. And then the fact that it, the rehab didn't go according to expectations for a number of reasons. Now we're outside of the bubble we have access to everything that we need. He's going to see a specialist next week. We have an idea of what the injury is. The specialist hopefully will be able to confirm that uh, it'll get addressed. And hopefully in a, in a, you know, a number of weeks, he'll be uh, back 100% and ready to go for the 2020-2021 uh, season. When the decision was made that he was going to play in, what was it, game three, I think, um, what, 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 what went into that decision? Well, first of all, how he was feeling, uh, how he was feeling, how he looked on the ice, uh, the doctor's opinions. Uh, so eventually he got, he gets cleared by the doctors because he's fine. The, the reality is he re-aggravated the injury during one of those five shifts, but he got to score arguably the most iconic goal in the history of our franchise. And then, you know, he got to, contribute not just with his you know his presence off ice which was significant but his present his presence on ice which I know means a lot more to the players he can say like I helped us win that I was on the ice I helped us win an important game and I got to raise the cup as the captain of the Tampa Bay Lightning and be fully deserving of getting that honor so just an awesome awesome story 
again, an iconic moment in the history of our franchise, probably in the history of our sport. And we're going to see replays of that goal for many, many years to come. As we should. What just what was your what were your feelings and your thoughts when you saw him? I mean, did you feel like, oh man, that's Stammer's got a you know he's got a shot, he can make this happen? Or I mean, because we were all we were all watching it at Amelie and we just jumped up. I mean, it, you're right, it was one of the the biggest goals that you know I think I've ever I've ever witnessed. My my thought process on that play is uh, well, I. I thought we were getting a really good scoring chance. We had a two on one with Steven Stankos has the puck on his stick. Like I, I, I'm expecting that good things are going to happen. Either we're going to score or we're going to get a really good scoring chance and hopefully generate momentum. But when he took the shot and he went in and it was such a, it was such a stammer goal too. Like it's a goal scorer's goal. It's a perfect shot. Uh, again, just a, a big, big goal. For our team in, in in getting us in our path to getting us to, to winning the Stanley Cup and a big big goal in the history of our franchise. And I'm I'm so happy that he got to be a part of that too because who knows how he would have felt if he never got to be on the ice for the Stanley Cup. But to get out on the ice to score a goal to know that you kind of are swinging the momentum of a game of a series and to know he, how important he is not just to the team but to our community to how much we love Stammer. I mean. It was just a massive, massive deal. And and to see the way that he's kind of soaking up everything, you it looks like Stammer played every single game of the Stanley Cup playoffs with the way that he's celebrating and taking it in, you know, as he should. As he should. So listen, I want to know how often are you shaving your head? Because you always are looking high and tight. You're looking, you're looking perfect right now. There is no playoff beard. Would you look like this at all? Would it be crazy? I mean, what what happens if you let it go? You know what? It's been a while since I've had it. Actually, I probably never had it that wild uh, <laughs> or that long. Uh, but I like this. This is low maintenance. You live in Florida. It's hot enough already. I like having it uh, high and tight and low maintenance. Get up in the morning. Don't spend any time on the hair. Don't worry about it. Put my mask on right now for uh, to keep everyone safe during the pandemic. Don't have to worry about it messing my hair. It's, uh, it's good. So to answer your question, every two weeks is usually what – when I, when I get it, uh, when I get it, when I either I do it myself or I get someone to do it. Okay, I figured you did it yourself. I don't know. I just... well, in the bubble, I had to. Usually, I go to a barber. In the bubble, uh, we actually had a barber in Toronto, so I went twice in Toronto. But once we got to Edmonton, I was on my own. But I brought the tools ahead of time. Okay, there were no players like knocking on your door trying to get a haircut from you, right? No, no one. <laughs> Luckily for them, no one. Uh, no one was looking for uh, for me to help them with their hair. No. <laughs> Um, just one more question about an acquisition of somebody I became a big fan of after I interviewed them during the, uh, the hiatus, Bogosian. I could tell that that guy wanted to win so badly. I don't know what the deal was, whether he forced his way out of Buffalo or what, you know, but I know that he just wanted to win. And I know Tampa Bay was somewhere that he wanted to come and, and, you know, bring that snarl that you, that you talked about. Could you tell, and did you know that Bogosian was going to be such a factor with this team in the playoffs? I did not know when I signed him that he would, uh, but I knew he was a good player. I knew that he had a lot of tools and I knew that he would fit the style of play that we were looking to play. So uh, he had a wealth of experience. He had some size, a powerful skater, a strong guy with a bomb of a shot. Like I knew he could help us and there was no acquisition cost. So it kind of became a, a no brainer at that point. Uh, got to know him a little bit over, you know, the course of the, a few months since since the trade deadline and you're right he was so driven to win he didn't really care what his role was uh, or at least if he did he never let on he just whatever the team needs whatever I can do he got scratched in some games didn't say a word worked his butt off in the gym worked his butt off in practice and when we put him back into the lineup he gave us exactly what we needed from him in order for us to, to win games and, and eventually win the cup I am happy for each and every one of our players. It is so hard to win. They're a bunch of great guys. You would be proud to call any of them a family member. But he's one of the good stories because he was in the NHL for so long without ever even playing a playoff game. And, and the fact that he was so selfless in, in trying to help the team by doing whatever the team needed from him, I think it, it – it, uh, it kind of bled into the rest of our group and, and it kind of, it was the attitude of everyone. And that's why you, that's why we won. You, you need that selflessness. It needs to be a team first all the time. There's no other way. So Julian, I want to know last question. I appreciate you taking time. I know you've been very busy celebrating and everything. 
Um, oh God, what was that? I lost my last question. Oh no. Where'd it go? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, it was about Mr. Iserman. I want to know what did you learn from from Steve Iserman and working with them, you know, for all these years? What was your big takeaway? You know, when I when I, I think of Steve, I think first and foremost of all the quality time we spent together brainstorming ideas analyzing what other teams are doing, analyzing players, our own other teams, uh, how they develop players, how they build a scouting staff, how they build a coaching staff, uh, how you get to be successful in the NHL. Like it's all that, all the time we spent doing that. And it was enjoyable because first and foremost, he is, he is very smart. He's an intelligent man. And two, he is very witty. He has a great sense of humor. He is funny. Every time my phone rings and I see Steve Eisman, I, I smile. Or if I call him and he's the first and he picks up, I start smiling because I know I'm going to have a good conversation. And uh, that, and then you tack on the fact that his integrity is unimpeachable. Uh, he will always do the right thing for the right reasons. You just enjoy the work with. Uh, okay, the last question that I wanted to ask you, the real last question was, um, have you cried at all? And it's okay to admit, I cried when they gave Stammer the cup. That was a moment for me. Was there any a moment or has there been a moment where you, you got a little bit emotional? There were many. It was emotional for sure. Uh, eyes got watery. It got dusty. It got dusty in some of those rooms. And it, it wasn't just the cigar smoke. <laughs> Listen, Julian, I appreciate it, man. Great job. Thank you so much for all the work that you did to bring a, a cup to, to this town. We appreciate it so much. We're so happy that we got to celebrate with the team. You're right. I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of these guys this, this year, high character guys. They do a lot for the community. It starts at the top at Mr. Vinnick. And, and thank you for taking time to explain the moves you made this year that, that led to a Stanley Cup. I really appreciate it. Seth, it was my pleasure. We should all keep celebrating. Absolutely. Thanks, Julian. Thank you.